The Lorraine North is a region that today is, is essentially from around La Pocatière going east toward Le Méchin. It's a, sort of an artificial title that would have been used to describe the area below Quebec. So the St. Lawrence, of course, widely opens as you go down the St. Lawrence. In this part of the world, as you go east, you're encountering rolling hills, you've got beautiful um, agricultural land reaching out towards the St. Lawrence. You've got the St. Lawrence, which is very tidal and full of nautical activity with boats going hither and thither. It's a region rich in agriculture, rich in forestry, now very rich in tourism. But it's always been a bit beyond the at the end of the end of the line to some extent, and it was just far enough away that people found it a great place in which to take the air, relax, and enjoy the summers of the St. Lawrence. Il semble que certains médecins qui conseillaient de venir sur les rives du fleuve ici, où le fleuve est quand même assez, assez large, au-delà de 20 km, euh, on disait que l'air était pur. D'abord, la population était moins élevée que dans les villes. Je sais, entre autres, que M. Bate et Johnny McDonald aimaient bien quitter Ottawa l'été parce qu'ils savaient qu'ici, l'air était... C'était plus facile de vivre, euh, les chaleurs étaient moins... En bordure du fleuve, c'est toujours un peu plus frais et l'air est pur. This area in particular is sort of what gives birth to the whole summer community. It's really to this area that people began to come. Uh, Pacuna, St. Patrick, um, Notre Dame de Portage. And that was partly because of the proximity to the nearest urban center, Quebec City, but also because it was where the train line ends. The, it's the Grand Trunk, which is built from Montreal East, it sort of stops in Rue de which is a big junction point for the railway, and it was really literally the end of the line. So if you were looking to um, leave the city, if you had means and and capacity, you would send your family and kids to a an air spa, which is sort of what this was. You would take the air, you would do a little physical activity, but you would often, frankly, just be in this sort of semi-pastoral environment, and this was what attracted people to Eastern Quebec on the south shore of the St. Lawrence. La famille McDonald's, euh, ils ont acheté la maison en 1882. C'est-à-dire, c'est l'aidé à Nielès qui a acheté la maison en 1882, mais il, a, il habitait déjà depuis au moins un été. Euh, alors, comment c'était ici? C'était, ben écoutez, c'était euh, la, vie, la vie à la campagne. À cette époque-là, il n'y avait pas encore l'électricité. Euh, pour l'eau courante, euh, L'aqueduc de, de Rivière-du-Loup n'existait sûrement pas encore. Euh, J'ignore s'il y avait un puits derrière la maison ou de quelle façon, de quelle façon on procédait pour euh, avoir de l'eau à boire. St. Patrick would have been a community like many others. Uh, the summer people would have come here. Often they would have followed their servants or their, their, their employees who would often come to a house like this and taken the dust covers off and opened it up, opened the windows, removed the dust, got the humidity out, and then the owners would come and they would establish themselves with a retinue of families. They would be cared for by this fairly substantial mass of servants who would be doing the kitchen work and the scullery work and sometimes doing the gardening and other things. And life was a life of leisure. You'd play cards on a beautiful um, brand like this. You would play other games. You would read. Um, you would play one other games. There's often 
golf and a bit of tennis. Um, the adventurous ones would go out into the St. Lawrence in a skiff or a canoe. Uh, the telegraph, of course, uh, was available because it followed the train line. So you were out of contact, but in contact at the same time. So you could be, if you were a politician like Sir Johnny McDonald, you would be, um, you would be kept up on the news on a regular basis. Quand Johnny McDonald est arrivé ici avec son épouse, sa fille qui était handicapée, il y avait aussi son beau frère, le frère de son épouse. Il y avait, bien évidemment, il y avait avec eux une, des, une ou quelques servantes parce qu'ils avaient quand même besoin, besoin d'aide, surtout pour leur fille handicapée. Et euh, Johnny McDonald a eu des secrétaires qui, je ne saurais dire s'ils habitaient la maison même, mais à une certaine époque, Johnny McDonald avait deux secrétaires qui répondaient au courrier. Et euh, c'était, bon, c'était quand même, c'était pas tout à fait la vie qu'il menait à Ottawa, mais c'était les vacances, mais en même temps le travail. Et c'était important qu'il soit bien, bien assisté. shoreline communities typically were, I guess you'd call them a shabby chic. I mean, it's pretty rustic living. It's, it's not camping, but it's not a luxurious hotel. So they chose this area for, I think, the air. They also chose it, frankly, because they could be with people they knew. And that, of course, in the Victorian era was important. You liked to holiday with people of your, of your own class. And so you weren't holidaying with the unknown. You were holidaying with the known, as it were. And they could be the known from your own business community or from your own from your own church. Um, uh, so it was a kind of a familiar area. Um, I think there was also those who came to this part of the world were also attracted by the proximity to the French Canadian milieu, the life that was around them, the kind of connection to, not living with, but they were available to communicate with these communities. And I think it was part of the attraction um, because it did take a lot of impulse and energy to leave a city and travel this distance. La route euh, qui existe devant, la 132, qui s'appelle maintenant la 132, était un chemin plus étroit à l'époque, un chemin où les, les chevaux euh, circulaient, sûrement pas en très grand nombre, mais bon, alors... Donc, on peut s'imaginer la vie de cette époque-là, c'est quand même... C'est loin, mais en même temps, on peut quand même s'imaginer. Anybody who studied Canadian history as I have knows that Sir Johnny is an important figure. He's a bit controversial uh, these days because of his stance on a number of issues, French Canadian language rights, native schools, and so on. But he is an important founder, not a perfect one. He's not somebody we celebrate like the Americans celebrate their founders, but he was an interesting politician, frankly more interesting than most that have followed him in that office. He had faults and foibles and weaknesses, one of which was well known, his weakness for drink. But he was a caring father, he had a very troubled family life, a son who did well but was estranged from him, a daughter who was severely handicapped. Um, so I think commemorating a person of that importance is significant. He was the creator of our confederate, our federation, of our nation as a confederation. He was also a man of um, great vision who established Canada not as, a, as an insular pocket in the British Empire, but a transcontinental nation. Uh, and the fact that McDonald came here from Ottawa, I think, is also an indication that he was a man who was also finding ways in which to bridge the difficult gaps that were already then evident between English Canada and French Canada.
My name is Gail Eakin, and I lived in that house because my grandparents owned that house. So I think I was the last occupant before it was given away to the Canadian Heritage of, of Quebec. The Union Jack is flying on the flagpole. My grandfather parked his Cadillac right underneath that flagpole, and every morning he put it up, and every night he brought it down. But I got to live with my grandparents one summer because my sisters were born and there was no, they were twins, and there was no room in the house for me. So I was put over with my grandparents. So in 1949, when I was just uh, eight years old, I stayed with my grandparents for that summer. Yes, we were all quite aware that it was Sir John A's house. We were um, very aware of that. Of course, the view was the best thing of all. The wonderful view of the St. Lawrence River. You could watch the belugas playing. And right down below the house was my grandmother's picking garden. She had her show garden in front, but down below she had the picking garden and she picked flowers every day and arranged them around the house. So the living room was just the most favorite place, I think. You could see the river on a rainy day. You could curl up on the sofa. It was, it was a great room. We went down in the basement, I think it was um, after my grandparents uh, had died, and there was this bed, the top and the bottom of a three-quarter bed, the way all the beds are in that house, and it had Sir John A's name and address in Ottawa on the leg of it. Um, we, didn't, we didn't fuss about it at all, we just left it there. <laughs> I guess it had been taken from there and brought down, and it had not been uh, used for a long time. It's only when it became a bed and breakfast that, of course, it became very important. When we were children, my parents always went over for dinner to my grandparents um, every evening. But us children, we had our midday meal over at my grandparents in the kitchen. We weren't allowed in the rest of the house and we ate in the kitchen. But when I was living in the house with my four children and my sister-in-law was with me with her three children, it was a mob scene, you can imagine. And the children had a wonderful time. They played in the dining room, which we had never been allowed into. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, th they did a play on top of the sideboard, which we had the kitchen ladder and they could climb up and they put on a play up there. And if my mother had ever found out, we would have been in deep trouble. <laughs> places to swim. One was down Shady Lane which was up near Sir Henry Bates house and that beach was you could walk down or walk across the field but the swimming wasn't very good there because the beach was very rocky and there's those sea grasses that were very uh, strong there so we mostly walked the other way down towards our cousins the Thompsons and we went down the golf club road and went to the beach there. I think Lady MacDonald did most of her painting down there uh, because there was views towards Riviere Lou, there was also views towards Notre Dame de Portage and the Pilgrim Islands and Meredith Island was also down there too. Well, Le Rocher is a substantial house uh, for a person who played a substantial part in creating the country called Canada. Ben, C'est un honneur pour moi d'être assise dans le salon de Sir John et MacDonald, bien sûr. Euh, on retourne quand même de plusieurs années euh, auparavant, quand on connaît l'histoire de cet homme qui a fait de grandes choses. Et c'est toujours assez impressionnant de d'être sur place et de, de se remémorer ce qu'on a appris. Et c'est intéressant aussi de le partager avec les autres. Il est un homme intéressant, 
who had an interesting life, who did amazing things, and who spent much of his time in this house thinking about how to make Canada better for us. Well, over the years, much has changed, and it changes almost invisibly before your eyes. But I think the, the reconstruction of Le Rocher has left anybody with a pretty clear impression of what Sir John A. Macdonald, uh, not a rich man, but a satisfactorily supported man, uh, could live that well in, with space and with a marvelous view uh, preserved by uh, generations of people. I don't think it will ever be allowed to die. And in this case, I'm involved in thinking ways that make it a very happy place and a user-friendly venue that Canadians of all ilks can come. You don't have to be rich to come here. You don't have to be a member of his family. You don't have to be connected to somebody in the Conservative Party. You can be none of those and you can still come here and, and I think come and learn a little bit about what life might have been like in the, in the late 19th century. Au niveau de la nature, bon, évidemment, si je regarde du côté du fleuve, je pense que les arbres ont poussé depuis. <laughs> Peut-être que certains ont été coupés. La vue sur le fleuve, eh bien, le fleuve est toujours là. Le fleuve, le fleuve par beau temps. Les couchers de soleil ici, le National Geographic disait que dans la région ici, c'était les plus beaux couchers de soleil après ceux d'Hawaï. Mm. Euh, mm. La nature était euh, sûrement, les oiseaux devaient venir chanter, dans les, devaient venir faire leur nid dans les arbres euh, derrière la maison. We're grateful to the Canadian heritage of Quebec for taking this monument to one of our great founding leaders and preserving it. So you can go there and feel the Macdonald reality uh, by some transposition. And for that, you've got to be very grateful. But it's remarkable for me to be surrounded by people for whom this region remains a, an attraction. I mean, these are families who are now living around the world, but their home with the capital H is the Lower St. Lawrence. You know, their homes in Montreal have once been being sold and their and their furniture and paintings have been dispersed and their you know the killed children and grandchildren living around the world and yet when they come together, it's in the Lower St. Lawrence. So it does illustrate, I think, the pull of the place. You know, these amazing landscapes that seem to change with every 15 minutes. It's sunny and foggy and then you get a great sunset. Uh, the people, I think this interplay between the English speaking people and the Protestants and the Catholics and the French Canadians and the local community and the suppliers and the farmers, I think that's very much part of the, I think the attractiveness of these kinds of places because they are rich in interplay, they're rich in kind of levels of interaction. Families have known the same families for a hundred years. They may not be close friends, but they're sort of associates or affiliates, and I think that's why people feel comfortable here and choose to come back here. But those who come, come because they're committed. They've been converted or they're committed from birth and they come back to this place. Like the birds come in the spring and leave in the fall. It's very much a migratory pattern that I think is very vibrant and very wild.